This is Musings of the Shy podcast. I'm your host, Hiroja Shy. Hello, Hiroja Shy here with another episode of the Musings of the Shy podcast. Here to wrap up my discussion about the Bitcoin block size debate, otherwise known as AKA Bitcoin is a messy bitch. And this is episode 155. La 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 la. Bitch, you better have my money. You don't know me well enough. So this episode, we're just kind of wrapping things up. Our kind of breakdown of the Bitcoin block size debate. You know, SegWit has uh, locked in and will be activated August 22nd, bar any significant catastrophes happening, which would be like either Skynet activating a nuclear bomb, knock on wood, some unconceivable I don't know, alien evasion, virus, or zombie apocalypse, something that no one else could have conceived of happening in the uh, That's going to happen. But before we wrap this um, discussion of this long process of breaking down what was going on in the Bitcoin cryptocurrency space, uh, talking about the, the many aspects of the, the block size debate, the news. So I have a link in the article about a Soviet programmer and open source software by Yvonne Fon uh, explaining why, you know, particularly, you know, Eastern European countries and Russia and why it's very important to have open source, but why those communities that in and of themselves are very strong um, in that um, aspect. It's written by Yvonne Kvon. Uh, it's from Size.com Media. And it's, a, it's a fascinating little read there about the inside and culture of perhaps um, you know, enough is written about, or at least I have not seen enough articles about about uh, you know Eastern European countries and Russia and about uh, technology and open source and why uh, in general they're, they're actually very good when it comes to tech. I don't think um, that part of the world is giving enough credit, if you will. This next article comes from PC Gamer. It's titled, Viking Cramps a Whopping 50 Terabytes of Capacity into a Single 3.5-Inch SSD. Uh, speed or Capacity, how about both? So, it's written by uh, Paul Lilly. If capacity is king, then all hail the new 50 terabyte solid state drive from Viking Technology, the most co- capacious uh, SED on the planet. Viking already launched a 25 terabyte model. And both are part of the company's ultra high capacity or UFC silo series and come housed in a standard 3 by 5 inch form factor casing for easy deployment. As you might imagine, these are intended for data centers and not gener- general consumers and are outfitted with a 6 uh, GP. PSSAS interface. While not for home use, it's nice to see computer companies push the envelope like this, hopes of higher capacity SEDs uh, trickling down into the consumer space. I can see something like that um, getting it out into the consumer space anyways. And, you know, people talk about nodes. Soshiro Nakamoto spoke about how uh, nodes would be in uh, network silos, if you will, where he predicted it would be like a, up to 100,000 those running to um, deal with the capacity of Bitcoin. And here we go with a 50 terabyte drive uh, for servers and drives out there. Oh God, imagine all the information you can put on there. These new drives use uh, planner multi-level cell or MLSD NAD flash memory chips and are undisclosed next generation flash processor. They're rated to deliver up to uh, 500 megabytes of sequential read performance and up to 350 megabytes of sequential writes, along with random read and write speeds of up to 60,000 IOPS and 10,000 IOPS, respectively. Uh, plenty of faster SDTs exist, though for clients wanting both speed and capacity, the UHC Silo Series is the instant solution. With regards to endurance, Viking says they can fill an entire drive once per day for up to five years. Wow. Viking also makes the claim that the, the enterprise clients can can see cost savings in power, space, and cooling for up to 80% per terabyte with these drives. Uh, So don't hold your breath awaiting for consumer 50 terabyte SCDs from any of the major players. While it can be possible to build one, the cost could reprice the amount of a contention with existing solutions, depending on the model. Uh, One terabyte SCD typically costs around 300 times that by 50, and you're looking at a 15,000 SAC drive. Yeah, I, I would imagine that this would hit the cryptocurrency space hard and someone, if they had not already done so, is investing in it. Um, I have a link in the show notes to um, the upcoming film, uh, Ready Player One, which I will do a review of both the movie and the book, uh, the book first. Uh, it's a fascinating look at the um, 
just like 80s pop culture and all the different kind of influences that um, were brought into that book is uh, one of the reasons why I'm reviewing it. It does have a lot of cyber cypherpunk and cyberpunk uh, feel to it. Uh, it's a great, just if you're an 80s kid or, uh, you know, early 90s kid, it's just a big nostalgia chip for a lot of people. And plus Steven Spielberg is doing the film, so it's 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 going to be good. He's I don't think he's really ever done a bad film at all. And whatever his bad film is, is, you know, is good compared to uh, other people's bad films, if you will, or even good films. And then our last story is from Ted Crunch. Uh, this 32-year-old state senator is trying to get patent trolls out of Massachusetts. Uh, patent trolls have been a plague to a lot of industries, particularly the, the tech industry. Uh, there was just a recent uh, victory where... The podcast uh, matter has been solved where the technology or at least the claim of the technology of podcasting has been kibosh and those patent trails have lost. So the worry about uh, small, big or everyday people having to pay some kind of licensing fee to podcast uh, has been kibosh, if you will. So this was posted July 14th by Connie Lizzo's. Uh, when the internet security company Cloudflare decided to engage in all-out war with what is viewed as a dangerous new breed of cat patent trolls, it found a receptive audience with Eric Lesnar, who became the youngest state senator in Massachusetts when elected in office in 2014. Senator Lesnar, now 32 years old, is the second two-year term, was in the same Harvard fraternity as FB, uh, Facebook CEO Mark Zuckerberg, but says he didn't really think much about the tech until after working on President Obama's first presidential campaign in 2007. I was traveling around with him and carrying suitcases and handling logistics for his traveling team, he explains. When the campaign was over, he joined then-senior advisor David Axelrod at the White House as a special assistant. He also became involved with the Council of Economic Advisors, and more specifically with the AGC chairman at the time, Economic Austin Goldsby. That's really when I started to get exposure to a lot of technology policies and some of the issues, he says. Fast forward to today, among the issues Senator Lesnar has become more focused on because he sees it as among the biggest threats to Massachusetts economy is patent trolling. Indeed, while he's not sure how much he can do to help Cloudflare, which has a Boston office, a bill that the Senator Lesnar helped craft will be heard in the committee next Tuesday and will put a serious crimp in what he calls a shakedown operation more broadly. Uh, more from the conversation we had this morning edited for Lynn. Uh, so it just, he just interviews it, and this is something that a lot of um, other states are doing to try to prevent these patent trolls where really this is at the federal level they need to change this. Uh, but many states are trying to prevent this because basically what these people are doing is they are bio patents, um, which are poorly written or poorly constructed patents, and they, they shake down these companies, primarily small businesses, is saying, you're utilizing this type of function. If you don't pay us $250,000, $500,000, uh, we're going to sue you. And most of these uh, small businesses, whether than to deal with a legal fight, uh, pay up. And so this is a gap in our um, judicial system. But most in gen- more importantly, it's just there needs to be an overall reform of both of the patent and the copyright system, because it's just not compatible with the needs of the 21st century. It just isn't. It's an antiquated system, and it's detrimental to the growth of the economy, detrimental to individuals, uh, freedom, uh, liberation, the growth of just uh, technological advancement. Uh, There needs to be a fundamental change. But it's great that Massachusetts is trying or seeking to attempt to address this issue. So in this ongoing discussion of the Bitcoin block size debate, or AKK, uh, Bitcoin is a messy bitch, we talked everything from the philosophy or the underlying foundations of Bitcoin in of itself, about the different groups, uh, political ideologies, economic ideologies that uh, kind of fed into the Bitcoin ecosystem that brought the different groups to people here. Um, I have a link in the show notes. Uh, I know a lot of the dominant voices are very, you know, capitalistic or anar- anarcho-capitalist, uh, libertarians, if you will, uh, in the space. But I'll have a link in the show notes to a YouTuber named Lewis Tomlin um, from Over the Pond uh, that comes from the left. Um, he talks about one of his recent videos of why he's in the space and his, you know, economic perspective. Uh, so I'll have a link in the show notes to, to him um, so you have an idea that there are, there are other types of voices, other people in this space. Uh, we talked about the roles of miners, what miners are, about the role China is mining, the different businesses in this space, uh, you know, what the fundamentals of the different aspects of Bitcoin, 
what segment was, uh, the different aspects of segment, the different BIPs, or the, the Bitcoin uh, improvement protocol process, the different proposals that didn't make it, like Bitcoin Classic, Bitcoin XT, uh, Bitcoin Unlimited. Uh, we discussed about the Hail Mary that was uh, Bitcoin Cash, which forked off in August 1st and is still here, is still active, it's trading around $300. Uh, you have uh, future projects that are being discussed is one of the reasons why SegWit activated, like Lightning Network, which is an add-on feature, a, uh, a second layer, if you will, uh, that was brought up in the discussion when it comes to the block size debate. We talked about the different people, uh, the different key developers in the space. And overall, it was just a kind of both a historical but a term breakdown in a little bit of perspective of what was going on in the space. And now that we have um, forked, there is a fork of uh, Bitcoin Cash exists. Uh, we also talked about user activated software, which did cause a fork, but may have put pressure on the miners to actually activate SegWit. Um, they, you know, instead of the users activating SegWit, it was the miners that put forth um, SegWit activation. Um, we talked about the changing dynamics. We talked about consensus and about the problem that consensus solved, which is the Byzantine problem. But what the difficulty of consensus and and how the human factor, no matter how much you do zeros and ones and bits, you might not be capable of engineering out the human factor when it comes to uh, group dynamics and individuals and their desires and people being basically the people. Well, overall, I just want to kind of you know, kind of cover just some of the recent stuff. Um, uh, Segwit has activated, is locked in August 22nd or August 23rd, around that period of time. Basically, the, kind of like when the fork occurred or uh, when Segwit first activated, like in the middle of the night here in the States. Uh, you know, Segwit is going to be locked in and it will be a feature, a permanent feature, unless some hard fork undoes it. I don't even know if you can un. No, yeah, you can't undo. Uh, there's bugs and stuff, I guess. You can undo undo features, but I think that would require a hard fork to do. Uh, SegWit um, is going to be locked in. Uh, trading volume for Bitcoin right now is around 3,800 3, from a high of 4,500 when I looked at it last. Uh, so it has a significant amount of volume, a significant amount of uh, money being pumped in. Uh, Coinbase is the first unicorn. Uh, technology company out of the, or say the not first unicorn technology company, but the first Bitcoin company that is valuation of $1 billion. It raised like $100 million plus um, through a series of trades or stock sales. Uh, it's made a lot of power moves in the financial space of various team ups that it's doing, particularly with uh, Fidelity Financial, which is an investment. Uh, one of the premier employer investment firms out there that does uh, people's RR, RIAs, 401ks, um, investment platforms. I will be doing a review on that on Hiroshi Stop. I, will, I know somebody that does have fidelity and see if this will be the, you know, the entryway to get them. Um, they are an older person to get into the cryptocurrency space. Uh, you can now link your Coinbase to your fidelity account if you have one through your employer so you can keep track of your cryptocurrency trades, but also start putting some money from your from your pension plan, I guess you can say, uh, into uh, cryptocurrencies. Uh, this is going to be a relatively short episode. I am going to do a few articles here uh, about just kind of the overall uh space so i have a couple that talked about um the segment logging in just for informational purposes uh but what i wanted to talk about was the roadmap uh many people have a doubt whether or not the 2x part of the segwit is going to activate and that is going to be a hard work it's not a soft work so sometime in november there should or could or will or will not be uh, it's a big if right now, a uh, two megabyte block raise. And what will that do to the community if there's a hard fork? Uh, Bitcoin Core has indicated that they're breaking away from the SegWit plan by uh, rejecting nodes that uh, validate the two megabyte hard fork, if you will. So they're already putting, Bitcoin Core is already putting implementations in place where they're not seeking um, or allowing for a hard fork. So if two the two megabyte is going to happen. It means that 
Um, all the individuals and players that are participated in the New York Agreement are going to have the hard fork because Bitcoin Core, uh, the maintainers of the current uh, Bitcoin legacy chain, if you will, are not going to permit a hard fork. They don't want it. They've been very much against it. Um, many of them are very hesitant about SegWit as it is, but they're very against any type of hard fork, and they are building code. Um, there hasn't been a BIP um, at this present time, uh, but I'm sure one's coming out soon where they were, they're, they're going to stop um, any type of hard forking. And so that's why there's a lot of doubt when it comes to whether or not the 2x portion is going to occur. But there is a roadmap and we're just going to kind of go over the roadmap um, as it currently is. So this is from uh, Bitcoin.com. Uh, it was written by Jamie Redman. Uh, it was published about six days ago. So, Segregated Witness has locked in, and Segregated 2X Working Group has announced its roadmap for the next three months. The team of developers have detailed that they are going forward with a 2 megabyte block size increase the miners and businesses agreed upon at the New York Agreement. Uh, the Segregated 2X Roadmap. It has been, it's been over 24 hours since Segregated Witness locked in on the Bitcoin network, and after nearly 90% of the miners pushed the protocol activation forward, now the Segregated 2X Working Group member, uh, Jean-Pierre Roup revealed that the team's plan for the upcoming 2 megabyte hard fork. The, now, the announcement is called Bitcoin Upgrade at block 494,784 states. That during the month of November of 2017, approximately 90 days after the activation of segregated witness in the, big, the Bitcoin blockchain, a block between 1 megabyte and 2 megabyte in size would be generated by Bitcoin miners in a move to increase network capacity. At this point, it is expected that more than 90% of the computational capacity that secures the Bitcoin network will carry on mining on top of this larger block. Compatibility with the new larger blocks. The announcement explains that the upgrade to the 2 megabyte was the first discussed at the Hong Kong Roundtable Agreement, that is the first agreement, and has further solidified with the New York Agreement. This year, the consensus conference. Both agreements involve implementing SegWit first and a block size increase from 1 megabyte to 2 megabyte later. The working group says that now that SegWit is locked in, the ecosystem should be should update to SegWit compatible software if they want to benefit from the protocol. Alongside this announcement, explains readiness and preparation for the fork, including port changes, network changes, DNS seeds, and the SegWit 2x testnet 5. The November 2017 upgrade to 2 megabyte box is a hard fork, but necessary changes are trivial to perform, explains the 2x working group announcements. Some SPV clients are expected to work without any change at all. Most clients will need to tweak only two constants to remain compatible with the new larger blocks. Uh, SegWit is here, but the Bitcoin community and fight remains. Uh, as the plan moves forward, many developers and Bitcoin community figures have been quarreling over the proposed upgrade. Moreover, last week, developer Matt Corral introduced an idea that would further separate the core reference client away from Segway 2X. They, they find an attempt to disconnect core software 0.150 further solidifies people's theories that the cryptocurrency community could see a third Bitcoin. A vast majority of Bitcoiners are discussing the subject thoroughly, and come November, the Bitcoin network may see some fireworks again. So you have that. Um, you also have the existing Bitcoin Cash. It looks like it's here to stay. Um, it's not going anywhere. Um, its value has fluctuated. Um, it's going through another difficulty phase where the mining power is going to drop and which is going to make it more profitable to mine a Bitcoin Cash versus uh, the Bitcoin Core um, chain. At the same time, the fees are extremely low, so some people are utilizing it for that purpose. Uh, at the same time, there's merchants and exchanges that are increasing, wallet providers are increasing um, development of Bitcoin Cash. And you're gonna, I think you're going to see some rapid development um, coming forward when it comes to this. Now, whether or not we're going to get a third coin, I guess come November we're going to find out about it. But again, um, it just comes down to the philosophy that hasn't really been fundamentally addressed by the community as a whole and i guess it's being fundamentally addressed now is bitcoin digital cash or is it storage value if it's storage value then i guess bitcoin core is going to win out but if, if it's digital cash you're going to see these forks you're going to see uh bitcoin cash expanding to exist you're going to see the segwit 2 megabyte chain uh whatever that may end up being called um, and you're going to see whoever has the most hashing power is going to be the winner of that debate and race and 
I don't know. I don't know what the solution is. I don't know if this is the best avenue of making a solution. I, you know, resolving these um, dilemmas. I, I think Bitcoin Core is playing a very dangerous game. Um, they thought they were playing already playing a game of chicken when it came to Bitcoin Cash, and we still end up having a fork. Okay, so I wanted to read these um, two little articles as well to kind of speak to the philosophy of kind of the root of the core of the debate. I know I haven't really talked about the to- toxicity too much, like the various uh, shots fired between different people within the space. I think pretty much Twitter and Reddit covers that. I don't think I really need to kind of go over that within the podcast space. But some of the trolling and the toxicity has kind of diminished. I think people have kind of settled down now that there's Bitcoin Cash, now that SegWit has activated. But I do think um, as we get towards November, I think that is going to kind of ramp up again, um, whether or not we're actually going to see this two megabyte uh, fork or not or upgrade. Um and also, when it comes to it, you know, money, you know, talk is cheap. And people are putting where the, their money where their, you know, the, their mouth is, if you will. Is that how the question goes? I don't, I don't know. But they're putting their money where they best, best believe. And there is a lot of money pouring into Bitcoin Cash. People that believe that Bitcoin Cash is, you know, Bitcoin is digital money. Hence its name. Um and still, there's still a rapid amount of people putting money into Bitcoin that sees it more of a storage value or are very disinterested. They just want to have, you know, their economic control and not really concerned whether or not Bitcoin is digital cash or storage value. They just want to have the utility, the value of a secured um, or a different monetary system than that, um, which we're all presently in. But here we go. Here's a little bit of philosophy. So here's Daniel Jeffries. Um, This was on HackerNoon.com. Why everyone missed the most mind-blowing feature of cryptocurrency. There is one incredible feature of cryptocurrency that almost everyone seems to have missed, including Satoshi himself. But it's there, hidden away, steadily gathering power like a hurricane, far out to sea that's sweeping towards the shore. It's a stealth feature and one that hasn't activated yet. But what it does, it will ripple across the entire world, remaking every aspect of society. To understand, we just have to understand a little bit about the history of money. Um, I'm going to read some of this. Um, I think we kind of already understand what the history of money is. Uh, the set of money. Money is power. Nobody knew this better than kings of the Asian world. That's why they gave themselves an absolute money on the minty moolah. They turned shiny metal into coins, paid their soldiers, and the soldiers bought things at local stores. The king then sent their soldiers to the merchants with a simple message, pay your taxes in this coin or we'll kill you. That's almost the entire history of the money in one paragraph. A coarse coin and the control of supply with violence, aka the violence hack, the one hack to rule them all. When power passed from monarchs to the nation states, distributing power from one strong man to a small group of strong men, the power to print money passed to the state, and anyone who tried to create their own money got crushed. And so, the power to grant a license is monopoly power. Kind of skipping here. Eagle was free to apply for interstate money transmitting license, but they just were never going to get them. And of course, they put them out of business. It's a living, breathing cash 22 and works every time. Kings and nation states know the golden rule. Control the money and you control the world. Kind of skipping down further. Hydra. The Hydra. In decentralized systems, there's no head or the snake. Decentralized systems are Hydra. Cut off one head and two more pop up in its place. In 2008, an honest programmer working in secret to figure out the solution to the violence hack and if once and for all, when he wrote, governments are good at cutting off the heads of central control networks like Napster, but peer peer to peer networks like Anolta and they, the Tor seem to be holding their own. And the first decentralized system of money was born, Bitcoin. It was explicitly designed to resist coarse coin and controlled by centralized powers. So totally wisely remained anonymous for that very reason. He knew they would come after him because he was a symbolic head of Bitcoin. That's what happened every time someone had came forward claiming to be Satoshi or someone has been outed by the news media as Bitcoin's mysterious creator. Uh, the real reason to cut off the, the official reason is always his purpose. The real reason is to cut off the head of the snake. As Bitcoin rises in value, the hunt for Satoshi will only intensify. He controls at least a million coins that have never moved from his original wallet. If VC Ch- Chris Dickinson is right and Bitcoin rocket to 100,000 a coin, these million coins will shoot up to 100 billion. Oh. If it goes even higher, say a million a coin, then that would make him the world's first trillionaire. Oh. And that will only bring the hammer down harder and faster on him. You can have be 100% sure that Black Ops units would be gunning for him around the clock. Wherever he is, my advice to Satoshi is this, stay anonymous until your deathbed. 
But resistance to censorship and bias are only one of the number of incredible features of Bitcoin. Many of the key components are already at work in a number of other cryptocurrencies and decentralized app projects, most notably blockchains. Uh, blockchains are distributed ledger, the third entry in the world's first triple entry accounting system, and breakthroughs into accounting have always presaged a massive uptick in human complexity and economic growth. As I've laid out in my in my article why everyone missed the most important invention in the last 500 years. But even triple entry accounting, decentralization, and resistance to the variance hacks are not the true power of cryptocurrency. They are merely the mechanisms of the system. The way it survives the virus is bringing new capacity to the human race. The ultimate future is that one that Bitcoin and current, current cryptocurrencies have only hinted at so far in latent features. The true power of cryptocurrency is the power to print and distribute money without a central power. So there we go. Um, this is why we have a bit of consensus issue. Uh, this is why there's so many attacks when it comes to exchanges, uh, making people go through exchanges with a K KYC and AML, uh, going after like local bent uh, traders, putting them in jail for up to five to seven years, going after the dark market websites uh, because drugs is such a huge commodity. If you can purchase that particular uh, commodity with any kind of cryptocurrency is kind of game over really for the fiat system. And as more and more of those drug markets uh, pop up, disappear, pop up again to become more and more resilient, um, you're going to see increasing, increasing value of those particular cryptocurrencies, particularly Monero has shot up in value. I think as dark markets and decentralized markets become uh, more adapt to the games that the government entities play, you're going to see an increasing value of cryptocurrency in general. And that's why you see uh, an effort on parts of many governments to regulate it. There are those that are trying to bring it into the fold. Uh, there's a, efforts to maybe perhaps change the bankability of Bitcoin. And what bankability is, is Bankable funds is this concept that, uh, you know, you hand over a certain, you know, your fiat currency and you can pay it for any type of things. You can buy, you know, paying cash for a house, a car, uh, a candy bar, coffee. But you can't do the same thing, even though it has a significant value like diamonds, gold, silver. There is not the same bankable power because banks are not going to take in your gold, your silver or your diamonds how you're able to turn around and take that high value item and then pay for other things or services is what makes something bankable. And right now, cryptocurrencies, bankability is being attacked. I think it is being attacked. I think it's there's efforts to try to narrow it to make it more of a digital gold and digital silver instead of the digital cash of what is promised to be. And that's something that we in the cryptocurrency space need to, to fight for. And I think that's something... When all these, you know, this debate about the different upgraded features of the Bitcoin block size debate is missing is the underlying economic philosophy of making sure that Bitcoin survives as a whole or cryptocurrencies in general survive as a whole. Um, the article continues, but I just want to mention that the fact that, you know, why Bitcoin exists or why it is so potent, why it's so many different groups, why there's so much money being poured into it. That's why there's, you know, debates about, you know, upgrades and features and what is it is because it's a centralized, it's not a centralized authority that is grounding this monetary value, this financial instrument value. It's a decentralized system. It's the people. And when you don't have a centralized authority uh, issuing money, a monetary system, then yeah, it's going to have a rapid change on just a global economy. It's going to have a rapid change of how people think about it. The economic system is going to have, there's a fundamental core belief systems are going to be challenged and changed and disrupted. And people are afraid and scared of that. Uh, even people within the space don't want to go so far. They don't want privacy features because they fear the government is going to come down on their, their door. Uh, they get compliant and complacent by going through K, um, you know, AMs, AML and KYC exchanges because they fear that if they go through local, boy, local Bitcoin, they might get arrested, which is true, um, and prisoned. But if we don't challenge these things now, if we don't challenge these things um, at this point in, in Bitcoin's existence, then we're going to get boxed in, um, whether we like it or not. So here's a different kind of perspective about um, the cryptocurrency space. Uh, 
you know, a lot of people, one of the reasons why Bitcoin Cash broke off is, again, people thought that Bitcoin is digital cash. It's not supposed to be like a, a bear bond or some traded asset. It's supposed to be something that you can utilize in your daily life. And yes, if you can have savings and um, have add, add a value, that's great. But its fundamental purpose is to be able to transact over the internet peer to peer without any hindrance. And so some people feel that with SegWit activating, uh, even with a two megabyte uh, block raise, with Coinbase getting that uh, unicorn status, uh, with all these VCs and um, banks and uh, major businesses getting into the space, um, some of that is being lost, if you will. So this is written by uh, Ranger Lister. Um, it's called Cypherpunks Activate. This is off of Coinspector.com. It originally appeared on Medium.com. So enough is enough. Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies slash blockchains are being neutered and usurped by bankers, VC status, pseudo libertarians, and a million miner and a host of opportunistic scammers. Cypherpunks and crypto anarchists need to come together to code and build businesses that will ensure our cryptocurrency delivery delivers privacy, anonymity, and financial security for individuals. I reached a tipping point during this year's consensus conference. I was Iceland at the time, but I followed along on Twitter when I could get up, could get Wi-Fi service, and I tweeted the following. In the thread, I tweeted numerous examples of all the wrong things I'm seeing in Bitcoin and blockchain right now. And please read them. Um, he has a link to his Twitter um, post. I had under 2,000 followers at the time, so my reach was and is still small. But the vote count, volume replies, and passion of private message demonstrated a broad demand for an alternative to consensus and the plethora of similar stated events. Next, I exchanged emails with a few individuals who volunteered to help me. All of us have limited time, but we pledged to make an event happen. We call it, we're call we calling it Website Coming Forward. Please follow us on Twitter at Cypher Chain, Chaney Con. The name comes from three places. There's not an event organized by professionals. We don't have sponsorship, money, or any staff. At this point, it's just an idea and an intention, and one that can only happen with your time, energy, and participants. This is your conference, VY Punk Style, but here's what we have so far. Goals. Bring together individuals who share a passion for Bitcoin, cryptocurrency, and blockchain, who have cypherpunk philosophy. Have, us, have user generate activity so it facilitates the implementation of the cypherpunk philosophy in software code, business investment, and other efforts. Themes. Pro privacy, security, peer review, pro productive trolling, uh, decentralization, open source, entrepreneur, success, fun, sovereignty, the individual. Anti. Centralization, closed source, scam, regulation. Uh, programs, talks, panels, debates, hackathons, music and art, social activities, costs, free, preferably, but probably unlikely. $200 or under in location in San Francisco, date within six months. We're still figuring out how to coordinate and we might use Slack, but we're open to suggestions. If you want to get involved in any capacity, please follow us on Twitter. Write in the comments below or contact me directly at uh, 21co, Ragnar, I use Signal and PGP. Let's make cryptocurrency great again. Ragnar. So, you have this, um, I think, really is just a direct resp response to what is going on within the Bitcoin space, the toxicity, the different types of businesses and plans that have been put in place to, um, again, it's just based on your viewpoint. Do you think Bitcoin is, again, cash or a bear bond or a storage value? And it's because of this uh, duality or this infighting. I think it's both. I honestly think it's both. But because of this infighting, what people think is one or the other, and it it can't be both, or one aspect is being so, is usurping the other, that you're going to have more and more of this happening. And I think you're going to see either better coins being developed, but, uh, better services, or when these forks happen, you're going to see some of these developers going into the other chain and developing different types of wallets, um, infrastructures to, to gain the... Um, privacy and security that they see to get what it is that they seek and want. And finally, just to kind of um, wrap things up here, I'm not going to read it, but it's, this is a little thing called the captive audience attack, a brief study of the collapse of decentralized societies. And it talks about what is possibly happening within the Bitcoin space and the different attack vectors that is happening and how we need to be cautious and vigilant and need to really reevaluate exactly where it is we want to go when it comes to the cryptocurrency space, particularly the the mother of them all, if you will, mother of all the coins, Bitcoin. 
So that's it for the articles. Uh, my last thought is just, um, you know, be cautious, be vigilant. Uh, Bitcoin is not going anywhere. Just take it within yourself and reevaluate what it is you seek from Bitcoin, from cryptocurrency. Do you want it to be just a stored value? Do you want it to be both? Do you think it should be uh, digital cash? Do you want an all the cart system? What is it you're doing actively? Um, because you can't be passive in this actively to bring forth Bitcoin into more spaces, big being Bitcoin more forth in your life, um, other people's lives. Uh, what are you doing to develop and contribute in a way that makes um, cryptocurrencies work, not only for you, but for others as well? And I don't mean just, you know, coding or anything like that. You know, it's important to get merchant adoption. It's important to make awareness. It's important to talk about it. It's important to discuss. It's important to get out there. Uh, talk to your uh, legislators um, around the world globally. Um, it's not just a state's issue. It's a global issue. Um, going to meetups, engaging people, um, going to peer-to-peer, um, combating, you know, FUD or misinformation, uh, you know, it's trying to make this uh, financial instrument, this this new monetary system, not only global, but functional and work for people, work for everyone, not just for yourself or a small group of people, but, you know, for everyone. So that's it. Um, that's my wrap up of, you know, Bitcoin is a messy bitch. Um, she's always going to be. It's a, you know, we're changing a fundamental system that's been part of human society for thousands upon thousands of years and it's not an easy task and so there's going to be a lot of eggs that are going to be broken there's going to be a lot of people that are going to be broken there's going to be a lot of hardships and heartaches and hopefully no violence um, but there will be setbacks there'll be great triumphs there'll be great victory but if we go forward and we be Go as one. I think that as time remembers, people are going to remember this time fondly. They're going to remember this time as a moment where there was a significant shift in uh, human existence. That's just, maybe I'm too much of an idealist, but I, I fundamentally believe that. So thank you very much for listening. And until next time, to the moon. Thank you for listening. Please wait and I have you iTunes or Stitchers or any of the podcasting app that you're currently using to listen to this show. Thank you, and until next time. This has been a Hello Shine Space Odyssey Network production.